Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. The hit cast offers a weekly look at Hollywood from a conservative point of view. Sick of media bias infecting Hollywood headlines? Tired of stars insulting your views? Hit has your back. Now, here's your host, Christian Toto. Welcome to episode 36 of the Hollywood and Toto podcast. Thanks for listening. This week, we're talking with Derek Wayne Johnson, the director of a great new documentary, John G. Avildsen, King of the Underdogs. But before our interview, I wanted to talk a little bit about the new Death Wish trailer, which dropped this week. Now, I have to say, it's far from perfect. I really don't like that ACDC song, Black, Back in Black. Now, I love the song, but its use here is a little bit jarring. This is a story based on a guy whose wife and daughter are brutally attacked, and having that in the, in the trailer just doesn't have the right vibe. Now, maybe... Once you see the movie, it'll, it'll either be used properly or maybe it'll just be discarded altogether, but we'll see. Also, some of those 80s kill lines, you know, the kind that Arnold Schwarzenegger used to use so effectively. Well, you got one or two of them here, and I'm thinking again, I don't know if that's the kind of, the right format for this, but we'll see. Maybe within the context of the movie, it'll be more enjoyable, or maybe the tone itself will be very different than the original film with Charles Bronson. Now, we also see a lot of death in the trailer. Of course, it's Death Wish, duh. But uh, I have to say, I don't think this is the kind of story where you want to have this guy mowing down hundreds of people. It's about a guy who's damaged by the, the, the attack on his wife and daughter, and he seeks revenge. It's a vigilante movie at its core. I don't think he's wiping out large numbers. Maybe he does. Maybe there's a lot of trash to be cleaned up in this particular city. This time it's set in Chicago, not New York. We shall see. But... Let's get to the fun part, the reactions from the left. Now, of course, they're dragging out the fascist card because they kind of do that instinctively. But it's a little bit sillier this time because, again, we don't know much about the movie. The fact that it's a white character played by Bruce Willis, well, that shouldn't really matter at all. Whether he's white or black, his life has been turned upside down, his family's been attacked, and he's seeking vengeance. Now, of course, that brings up its own moral questions, but let's have it. Let's have that debate. Let's have the discussion, and let's see how the movie plays out. What I'm surprised about here is that the fact that Willis's character is wearing a hoodie, a hoodie a la Trayvon Martin, that one really hasn't kicked up as much consternation as I expected, although maybe it's coming soon. Who knows? It would be interesting to see if Samuel L. Jackson were cast in the Charles Bronson role, what kind of reaction he would get and what kind of reaction to the trailer. But again, that would be living in an alternate universe. We don't have that particular benefit at this point. Now, What's interesting about the reaction this time, though, is that it actually echoes what we heard years and years ago. You know, the term fascist was used both with the Death Wish movies back then and with Dirty Harry with Clint Eastwood. So it's not exactly new, but we're living in a much more woke society. So anything approaching vigilante justice, well, the fascist card gets played hard and often. So now Death Wish isn't out yet. It's coming in November. We've still got a couple of weeks before then. Maybe we'll get more trailers. Maybe we'll find out more information. But another thing intriguing about the film is the director. This is Eli Roth, who was once sort of a horror wonderkin who really hasn't done much lately. His more recent films have been unsuccessful. I don't think they've been very good. I think his uh, his persona was a bit overrated when he came on the scene. But he did move, make a movie a couple of years ago called The Green Inferno. Yes, it was a horror movie. Yes, there was lots of gore. But it also was about a group of do-gooders who go into a jungle community and get attacked by savages, cannibals. This is social justice warriors literally being eaten by the tribes they're trying to protect. So, you know, this is a guy who clearly may be left of center in his personal life, but he doesn't mind stirring things up on the big screen. So it'll be very interesting as time marches on what we know about the film, the reaction, and also some of the comments that are made once it gets released. That's just the way we live in our culture right now. We prejudge, we get outraged, and Maybe in a couple of months we'll be so exhausted we'll have to move on to something else, even when the movie's in theaters. We'll see. You're listening to my daddy's podcast. He lets me binge Bob's burgers with him. Thanks, Eli. This week's hit tip of the week is Slither. It's an early effort from Mr. Guardians of the Galaxy himself, James Gunn. Now, this is not Oscar material by any stretch. The 2006 film is silly and goofy, and it's got kind of a sci-fi fantasy mixture, but boy... 
It was fun when I first saw it. I'm looking forward to seeing it again on home video. This is a combination of kind of ha-ha funny and some shocks, but you've also got some really good actors here, kind of before they became really famous, including Nathan Fillion and Elizabeth Banks. And of course, you have an early uh, appearance by Michael Rooker, who's gotten much more famous now, thanks to those Guardians of the Galaxy movies. So good cast. B-movie mayhem, what more could you want? This is the kind of movie that I like to watch again and again. And because it's by Scream Factory, they are expert at loading their Blu-ray releases with all sorts of good interviews and extra commentaries, extra scenes, all sorts of goodies for the movie fans themselves. So check it out. It's Slither. It's the 2006 film, but it is out brand new on Blu-ray thanks to Scream Factory. Could be fun all over again. You're listening to the Hollywood in Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. Now let's get to this week's hit cast interview. Derek Wayne Johnson worked steadily for years as an actor, but in his heart of hearts, he wanted to be a director. He got an unexpected mentorship from John G. Avildsen. And if you don't know the name, you should. He was the fellow who directed The Karate Kid and also Rocky. Remember that movie? It was kind of a big deal. Derek pays tribute to his director, Avildsen, who passed away recently with John G. Avildsen, King of the Underdogs. It's a new documentary available now on Chassis Media, that's Chassis.com, and also on iTunes and other home video outlets. It's a story of a director who just never got the attention, never got the acc- accolade that he deserved. Yes, there were some clunkers in his resume, but you know what? No one made underdog movies quite like him, and it's a little bit sad that that style of filmmaking has kind of gone away. It's not hip, it's not cool anymore, and that's a shame, and maybe that's a reflection more in our culture than anything else, but boy, I wouldn't mind if those kind of movies came back. But here's our chat with Derek Wayne Johnson, who talks about the film, some really cool stories about Burt Reynolds, and a whole lot more in this week's HitCast. Derek, thank you so much for joining the show. Yeah, I know you first met John G. Hamilton after he rejected some of your original scripts. And I was thinking, you know, a lot of people would have walked away from that like, oh, heck with him. I'm out. You know, I think it's it's it can be deflating. But obviously, you had a different reaction and you kept contacting John. Talk a, bit, a little bit about that moment and why you persisted in that way. Well, it was just one of those things like I just couldn't give up. I couldn't pass up a wonderful opportunity. And also, as cheesy as it sounds, I mean, isn't that the kind of like the basis of his films? You know, don't give up. If you're the underdog, strive for, you know, for success. And I just knew that I needed to work with him. And this shot doesn't come around, you know, very often. I mean, it, it really isn't often that you get to meet your hero, befriend your hero, become mentored by your hero, make a movie about your hero. It just doesn't happen every day. So I don't know. There's just a drive inside. And, and I just had to take advantage of the opportunity. And when he said yes, it was like, wow, now I have to follow through. That's so, right. Yeah. So did he initially like the idea of a film about him? What was his initial reaction? Because he doesn't seem like an egotistical fellow. He seemed a little more grounded, more kind of, you know, like the kind of guy who would let other people kind of get the glory and, and let him sort of fade in the background in a way. I think he was a little burned in the past. Um, I think people had maybe talked about these things before, or I think he was always kind of teased sometimes about certain projects and then they never followed through. So I think John was used to people just not following through on things. And so he was a little, uh, you know, uh, flattered at first, but I remember like our, our first conversation about it, uh, when we really got in depth, we were talking on the phone and he actually kind of, kind of got heated in a way. And what, and by that he was just kind of like, look, you know, blah, 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 blah. This is your project. You know, you show me something, you show me, uh, that you're going to do this, you Mm -hmm. know? And it was kind of like, he was not talking down to me, but he was, I could sense he had been burned before. Yeah. So as, as it, when he really saw that I was serious and, and whatnot, he warmed up and, and it didn't take long at all, you know, for him to say, okay, you know, you're really doing this and this is a serious project. And he, he changed his tune. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it was really sad to see him like kind of be that way at first, but then it was just all, you know, roses after that. <laughs> yeah. Now I, I understand he worked with you on the film, but obviously let you have the final say. Can you talk about how he maybe made it better? Was there a scene or a moment or a theme or something about the film that you think, boy, you know, John, I, I followed his advice and he was right. Well, yeah, he, uh, he never stepped over me. He always said from day one, this is your film. You're the director. 
but if you need, you know, advice or anything, you know, let me know. So he gave hundreds and hundreds of notes because towards the end of this thing, he wanted it to be just right. And, you know, he knew it was preserving his legacy. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were moments like I remember the first uh, rough cut that he saw uh, a year into production. He was like, you know, it was like it was 90 minutes long and we were chronological and we were hitting on all of his films. And he was just like he was so moved and touched by the the film. But he was like, man, come on, you got to take about 30 minutes out of this thing. He was like, this is too much. And we were like, what? You know, like what? Who tells you to take 30 minutes out of a movie about them? You know, and and he did. And he was right. So that was a huge change where we were like, OK, we're going to be a little bit more Rocky and Karate Kid centric. Mm -hmm. and less about the duds because the duds were just kind of boring quite frankly uh not the movies but the the you know how they were set up in the documentary so that was a big change and just you know one thing he wanted me to do is he wanted me to uh, infuse the doc with more of his father and more of that whole story which he was right about Mm -hmm. um he also wanted me to hit on his documentary traveling hopefully and uh which he was uh, he was nominated for an oscar for And so there were a lot of things like that where we basically would talk about, you know, cutting the fat and infusing more muscle. And he was right. Yeah. One of the things that was, I don't even have to say what my response was, but watching Burt Reynolds was fascinating. You know, in a movie like this, you've got the, you've got the quotes that you expect, you know, Talia Shia and Ralph Macchio. When Burt Reynolds comes on the screen, here's this legend and he's in no mood to get to make nice with John. Talk about that experience. I mean, in a weird way, I think it makes your movie better. Uh, were you surprised by Burt's comments and, and anything you can kind of share about that, that element of the story? Well, first and foremost, Burt Reynolds was the biggest gentleman. He, it, we flew to his house. He opened up his house to us. He was so generous and so kind, and we spent the whole day with him. And, and, his, and we knew going in to the whole thing, like he told us straight up, I don't like John, and <laughs> it's not going to be pretty. And John always would say, I don't like Burt. So – They carried that beef for years, but, you know, I have a lot of stuff off. Well, there's a lot of stuff that didn't make the documentary because I just couldn't put it in a lot of the stuff that he was saying because it kind of would like it would take away from the sweetness that the film is. Mm -hmm. So we put in just enough. However, Bert would always follow up with, but I respect him, but he's a genius, but he's a great guy. So it's like I don't like the guy, but I respect him and he's he's the best at what he does. And I I actually threw him a curveball. It didn't make it into the documentary, but I said, Mr. Reynolds, oh, I'm going to throw something at you. What would it be like if you saw John again? And he said, is he here? I go, no, 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 he's not here. No surprises. But what would it be like? And he says, you know, I think it would be good. Yeah, it it would be nice. Actually, I'd I'd like to see John again. And it was just like this. It's like, you know, deep down, these guys get older. They bury the hatchet. And when when John saw that, I played that for him. uh, That meant a lot to him. Wow. That's a, that's a great story. And I, I hope it, uh, when the eventual DVD comes around, can you have that those, sort of those extra features? Do you think that'll be part of the uh, the bigger package? Package. Unfortunately, it's not. The only thing that we added was uh, for special features is the trailer and audio commentary with myself and my producing partner, Chris May. Okay. Um, who knows? Maybe throughout the process, maybe we'll release some stuff online. Um, we'll see. But yeah. definitely, ha- it's there. I have it all. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the film's key themes, obviously, is – they literally don't make him like this anymore. With John's style, uh, you know, his approach to filmmaking, his approach to stories, it's not hip at this point. And I was kind of curious from your perspective, having worked so deeply with this process, what does that say about our culture? I mean, or, or is it fair to, to kind of criticize our culture because of it? Or is it just uh, is what it is? I think it's a, I think, you know, there's a lot of fads and there's a lot of just this is hip now, but maybe it won't be later or this is going to come back in a style, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if you look at, at John, you know, before him, there was Frank Capra and they, they called him Capra corn. They felt his stuff was so corny. But look, at it's a wonderful life. I mean, it's one of the best movies of all time and it's just it transcends generations. So there was Frank Capra before John and then there was John. And he was very inspired by Frank Capra and they got to know each other. And and Frank Capra actually said, I I wish I made Rocky. So (laughs) I think John was the last of his kind in the sense that he made straightforward uh, movies of straightforward storytelling. Um, These age old uh, story, you know, elements to it that he uh, that he put to the big screen that charmed audiences and motivated audiences. I think then when the 90s hit, it was all about the twist. 
It was all about let's go, let's flip the script. It was all about let's you know dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. How can we be hip and cool? And I think straightforward storytelling is going to come back. I mean, I think it's a I think it's a cycle. You know, look at like three D movies. That's kind of a cycle, right? It's in in the fifties, then it's back in the in what the eighties, and it comes back in the two thousands. Maybe uh, John Avildsen type films will come back, and I hope to be a part of that. You know, obviously, there's a big nostalgia factor with your film, and I think it's one of the reasons why it it kind of registers with me, and I'm sure other people as well. Talk about the you know you you you've at these screenings where you get together, you know, Karate Kid, you know, thirty plus years later. What is the audience like when you go to those kind of events when you're showing that footage again? Because you know, we talk about sort of the fad and sort of things coming and going. I sense if if the right director comes along with the right project, I think one movie can kind of recharge the culture in that way. I, I, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, the audiences are, are amazing. They they come out in droves, and you know they're they're there to see the stars, and they're and they're it's it's and it's a lot of you know older older guys. It's not like it's not it's like thirty and forty somethings, you know, and they're bringing their kids, and their kids are getting to experience these uh these films. So. It was really great, you know, going around and filming those events and watching how people take to John and Ralph and all these guys. And, uh, you know, it's just, I don't know, it, it, those films still hold up. And you and I would sit there and I would watch, like, uh, these kids, they would get up and cheer. And they would get up and do the crane kick. And, 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 and grown men would still shed a tear. I mean, these films, again, like It's a Wonderful Life, like Casablanca, they're not going anywhere. And they're going to stick around forever and they're going to keep inspiring people. And, you know, the nostalgia factor, like you said in, in the documentary, um, yeah, it's full of nostalgia. And it, it, what we tried to do was is we tried to make a documentary feel like a John Ableton movie would feel. Even with the music, I told my, uh, my composer, Greg Sims, who was a wonderful film composer, I said, let's make it sound like a movie, not a documentary. Yeah, and you know, so you get a lot of those uh, those feels uh, in in our documentary. At least I hope you do. I, you know, I don't think it fits in the documentary. I think the story works so well by itself. But as a as a movie fan, I wanted to know more about John and why. I think his last big screen credit was 1999 with the John Claude Van Damme movie. Was he trying to kind of keep on making movies and and he just couldn't you know m- move the needle? What was it like for him, or did he just kind of maybe just have, sit back and say, "Hey, I've had a great career, I've hit so many highs, and if Hollywood is not in my wheelhouse now, then that's okay." I think there's a lot of factors. Uh, I'll start with this: at the end of his life, he was attached to three different projects. He was oh. he was making a comeback. He was ready to go. He he already actually one of the people that was uh, signed on for one of his films was uh, Martin Landau who just passed away wow. and um, he was going to bring you know Talia Shire back and there were uh, Burt Young and uh, some other people I can't name but there things were happening he had three scripts that he was attached to and you know before but before that in that almost 20 year gap you know there's the question what went wrong what happened and the thing is is John isn't the type of guy that's going to go out and be a go-getter and go find funding and, and, and all that stuff. He's the kind of guy, and he says in the documentary, you know, he would wait for the phone to ring. Well, then the phone stopped ringing. And that was just his personality. I, I think maybe if, if that drought had happened in the 80s, he probably would have picked up the pace a little bit. But, um, yeah, he was a little older. At that time, he already had a 30-year career. So, he, you know, he probably just lost a little bit of pep in his step. But he was certainly, certainly thrilled to make his comeback. And it's so terribly sad that he didn't get to do that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad he was able to see it and, and, and experience it with some audiences because I'm sure he just absolutely adored that. But uh, oh, talk a little bit about your career. Uh, you've got a pretty long list of acting credits. You've, you're starting and doing directing. How did you emerge from this process? Do you, do you think you're a better director than you were beforehand? And what? how did you change from, from this whole experience? Yeah, I, you know, I used to be an actor and I was always an actor and a filmmaker at the same time. So growing up, you know, I was like, oh, I'm the next Orson Welles, right? We all think that. And then you're like, uh, eh, nah, not so much. So I wanted to be an actor and a filmmaker and I was, I spent so much time on both. But really what I am is a filmmaker. I gave up acting. I was like, you know what? I think acting was a way for me to really find myself as a director, as a filmmaker. It was, a, and it opened a lot of doors for me. And a lot of the best directors, obviously, were actors. So I put the acting aside. That's long gone. 
but the filmmaking, the writing, the producing, the directing, the editing has always been there with me. I've always wanted to be a filmmaker since I was three years old, since I saw The Karate Kid Part 3 on the screen for the first time in uh, 1986. And, uh, excuse me, The Karate Kid Part 2 mm-hmm. when I was three. I think that's what I said. Yeah, in 1986. So I knew early on. So my career has been, you know, I've been, you know, working my way up. And, and when I got, I've made some, you know, narrative feature films that no one's ever heard of, but they're out there. And when I got this project, it completely changed my life. It completely just kind of sealed my fate, I suppose, as a, as a filmmaker. And I learned so much. I mean, every day with John, I learned not just about being a better director, but being a better person. And I just, you know, it's weird. It's like, you know, he had Frank Capra and I had him. You know, and it's uh, it was a wonderful mentor, and my now my career is just completely changed, and uh, getting a lot of offers, and I have John to thank for that because without this documentary, I would probably still be doing you know low budget narrative features that weren't going anywhere, mm-hmm. and this opportunity John gave me has just completely changed all of that. A few years ago, when uh, Sylvester Stallone was doing Rocky Balboa, I interviewed him, and I was trying to gently ask him. Well, Rocky Five wasn't very good, and people are suspicious of this movie. And rather than be offended by the question, he goes, I know, I know. And he was such a great interview and a fun guy. And I heard that you had a really good first meeting with him. And obviously, I want to get to a little bit more about your projects with the Stallone family. Uh, talk about Sylvester and, and why you guys clicked and what you came away with from that first meeting. Yeah, I mean, the first time I interviewed him, he was uh, just fantastic. It was, my, it was the best day I've ever had on set, ever. Nothing went wrong. Everything was perfect. It was magical. And except, you know, his phone went off during the interview, but that's on him, not me. (laughs) And it was just wonderful. And we just clicked. And I remember he was so thrilled that, you know, I was asking questions that he had never been asked before. He got to talk about things he's never talked about before. And he was really thrilled by that. And, you know, it's all in the documentary. And then, uh, you know, since then, he's just been really wonderful to myself, to my team, um, I just interviewed him uh, last month for uh, another film that we're doing, and we've got a couple other things coming up. So, you know, even after Underdogs, uh, uh, not even a year ago, just several months ago, he invited myself and Chris May over to his house, and uh, we screened King of the Underdogs for him, and he loved it. And uh, it was so cool. Afterwards, he put on Rocky, and we were just kind of dissecting scenes from Rocky, and he was giving us tidbits and stories, and how cool is that to sit there and show – Sylvester Stallone, your film that he's in at his house, and then he puts on Rocky and kind of breaks down some scenes for you. So <laughs> Sly is just a really cool, nice guy. Um, every time I see him, he just lights up, and he's just he's he's everything that you want him to be and that you expect him to be. Yeah, you know, I had a former movie blog, and whenever I write about Stallone or Rocky or anything, the traffic would burst, and people are so engaged by him. Talk about the your, your movie. It's going to focus on Rocky, and you said it's not going to be like other Rocky documentaries because it's obviously a kind of a well-worn topic. What do you hope to kind of bring to it? What kind of fresh perspective do you have in mind? Well, with uh, with the Rocky documentary we're doing, it's going to be heavily, heavily, heavily uh, based on John Abelson's home movies, rehearsal footage, behind the scenes footage from the making of the original Rocky. It's uh, now a lot of people have seen most of that stuff, but I actually have a lot of new stuff that hasn't been seen Mm -hmm. and that, that John gave me. So we're really going to explore literally the birth of this classic. Um, And it's going to be just a unique approach that, you know, we, that you really haven't seen before. And um, it's unfortunate again, that John was going to be a part of it. And uh, now he, he can't. I wish we would have gotten to him before his uh, his passing, of course. But um, yeah, we're just going to put a kind of a new, fresh, unique, and very nostalgic spin on a on a Rocky documentary. And then, of course, um, we've got uh, another uh, Stallone documentary that we're working on right now called Stallone Frank. That is <laughs> about uh, about Frank Stallone, uh, Sly's younger brother. And, uh, yeah, it's just pretty cool to have these documentaries back to back to back, you know, with the Stallones and, um, we're very excited. Yeah. So talk about the, uh, as a filmmaker, sometimes even the the biggest names get bogged down in financing and getting the, you know, all the things arranged. Uh, do you find that you sort of, you're more savvy about that now having gone through this whole experience? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, <laughs> 
this experience has been just incredible. I hate using the word journey because it's so trite, but it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. We've learned so much, my team and I. I mean, we went, you know, we hit the ground running and uh, we worked on this thing for three years on underdogs. And the knowledge that we've attained and the experience and the mistakes we've made and whatnot, I just, you know, the confidence level is and the morale is way up. So we're ready to tackle Hollywood and, and we feel like we're capable and, uh, you know, ready to do it. Are there any directors working today that if not quite that John Avildsen spirit have a have a, a, a touch of it, a twinkle of that that kind of humanity that he that he brought to his films? Well, you know, let's talk about uh, Creed real fast. Ryan Coogler did a fantastic job. And, um, you know, in that, and if you think about it, there's three directors that made Rocky movies. And that's John Avildsen, Sylvester Stallone, and Ryan Coogler. So uh, it's pretty cool. There's so many Rocky movies. But when you think about it, there's only three directors. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I think Ryan's uh, a very you know wonderful director. Also, uh, in, a, in a different type of way, if you look at David O. Russell's films, um, look at the, you know, The Fighter. He actually was quoted as saying, I wanted to make my own Rocky. And I remember he actually invited John Avildsen to, uh, I wasn't sure, I don't, can't remember if it was a screening or a party or something when the fighter came out so he could meet John Avildsen. And John was tickled to death to, to be there. So um, I think in this day and age, no one really has, has it on point like John had. Um, there is some sort of magic that John brought to these films that I haven't seen yet and since. Um, there are a lot of, uh, movies that have been ripped off or that have ripped off these films, uh, of course, but, uh, I'm sure there's some talented, uh, guys out there that, uh, you know, men and women that, that have that spark that John has. And, you know, it's kind of, it's my cup of tea, you know, that's the kind of films that I want to make, but I don't, I also don't want to, one thing I fear is I don't want people saying, oh, you know, he's just going to follow in John Allison's footsteps and that sort of thing. That's not the case. John and I actually had a lot of differences in tastes on a lot of things. Like, for example, he doesn't like horror films or sci-fi or action or he doesn't he didn't like any of that stuff. And I mean, I, I dig a lot of that stuff. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of th- things that he taught me, but there's also a lot of things that I like to do on my own. And um, and uh, yeah, hopefully I won't get pigeonholed uh, <laughs> on my next films. Looking at King of the Underdogs, it seems like you got every major voice that you'd want for that to tell that whole story. Was there anyone missing? Were, were there any actors or directors that you really wanted to kind of share what they had to say about John, but just just couldn't happen? Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get Morgan Freeman due to scheduling, but he is he does appear in the film in a, in a vintage like twenty something year old uh, piece of video that we that we have, and um, we wanted to get Susan Sarandon, uh, Daniel Craig. You'll find out, of course, in the documentary that uh, John gave Daniel Craig his first uh, film role, as well as Susan Sarandon. And we couldn't get them for scheduling. Um, We couldn't get Elizabeth Shue, so we had to use, uh, you know, vintage stuff of her. And so, yeah, there were a lot of people that we wanted to talk to, but the people that we did get to talk to, it was just amazing, the uh, the roster that we had. And filmmakers as well. We we reached out to Steven Spielberg, but unfortunately he, he couldn't do it. But, uh, you know, I think he wanted to do it. He just he could he was too busy to even do DreamWorks uh, stuff. So, um, you know, we did get Scorsese and that story right there is quite remarkable. Um, I, I'll, I'll save that for audiences to find out <laughs> what Scorsese has to do with Avildsen. You're not going to believe it. And uh, there's so many little hidden gems in this in this film that I mean, it's just remarkable the, the impact that that John had on people. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that the fact that he was always shooting, always shooting, even in his later years, he's got his phone up and at people. I, I think that kind of captures him in a, in a nutshell. Uh, Derek, before we let you go, uh, guests of the, How- the Hollywood and Total podcast, we always ask them what they're checking out on, you know, maybe on Netflix or home video or what's on their nightstand, what books are they reading. Is there any sort of content tips you can share with us that uh, maybe give us a, another, another thing to check out above and beyond King of the Underdogs? You know, I was thinking of this because uh, I knew you were going to ask me, and my mind is so bogged. But I will say this, and it's kind of a cop out. Talking about books, sh- everyone should check out a book called "The Films of John G. Avildsen: Rocky, The Karate Kid, and Other Underdogs." It's a film. Uh, excuse me. It's a book that came out a few years ago, before this documentary, that a friend of mine, Tom Garrett uh, and Larry Powell, wrote, and it's a very detailed 
book about John Abelson and his films, and they go through every film, and it's fascinating. And I've read it at least three times. So uh, I highly recommend that. Uh, you can find it online, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and it's kind of like a nice companion to our uh, documentary. Excellent. Well, I have that information, that link in the show notes page at HollywoodInToto.com. Derek Wayne Johnson, thank you so much. The movie is John G. Avildsen, King of the Underdogs. I highly recommend it. You can have a great time. It's not just nostalgia. It's a great story. Lots of different themes that I think people from different ages will kind of connect with. And uh, it's available on Chassis Media. That's Chassis.com. But you'd also check it out on iTunes and other outlets as well. And Derek, maybe we can check in down the road in a couple of years when you've got your Stallone epics launched and ready to go. That sounds fantastic, and I really appreciate you uh, having me on the show. All right. Thanks again. Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out HollywoodandToto.com for both the show notes and, of course, the latest entertainment news. Please follow me at Twitter at Hollywood and Toto. And we'd love it if you leave a podcast review over at iTunes. See you next week.